哈喽，大家好，欢迎来到洛杉矶华资讯网的直播现场，我是主播莉亚。在今天，美国一亿两千六百八十万的家庭中，有两百万到三百七十万的十八岁以下儿童是由 LGBTQ Plus 父母抚养长大的。那么，这个数据足以能够体现如今美国家庭的组成是如何的多元化。非常多的同性 couple 渴望拥有自己的宝宝，让他们的家庭变得更加完整。在 LGBTQ Plus 成员通往成为 parents 的路上。捐精或者是捐卵，再加上代孕，它就是一种非常普遍的选择。这个过程呢，是相较于异性父母来说有些许的差别。那今天呢，我们就聚焦在男同性伴侣家庭的话题上。那么，我们将会从医学的角度上为大家来讲解，如果一对男同性伴侣，他们想要一个宝宝，需要经历怎样的过程，以及要为他做哪些准备。今天加入节目现场的是被美国 Newsweek 新闻周刊评价为美国最佳生育诊所的 HRC 生。医院 Encino 分院的专家 Dr. David Turgman。David Turgman 他是在生殖领域生根了三十多年，曾经是南加州大学 UIC 生殖内科分泌以及不孕不育症的妇产科助理教授。他被包括《纽约时报》还有《早安美国》等多个美国知名期刊进行报道。Hello, Dr. Turgman. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Leah. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Sure.、Uh, so today's topic is becoming increasingly important for many families. How male same-sex couples can have a baby. So to start off, could you please introduce yourself and share some details about your professional career with our audience? Absolutely, Leah.、Uh, my name is、uh, Dr. David Turgman, as Leah was kind enough to say.、Um, I began my career as a professor at the University of Southern California here in Los Angeles. Um, I was an academic uh, professor there for approximately five years, and、uh, at that time, what happened was I was offered a position、uh, at the HRC facility,、mm -hmm. and、uh, I decided to transition、uh, to mostly a clinical practice where I could take、uh, care of patients as opposed to just doing、uh, research and teaching.、Uh, so. Uh, about 20 years ago now, I became a full-time uh, 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 partner here at HRC in Encino. Wow, that's wonderful! It's clear that you have extensive experience in this field. Now,、uh, when it comes to male same-sex couples, assisted reproduction is often mentioned. Is IVF the only way for them to have biological children?、Uh, it's a good question, Leah.、Uh, When we、uh, are talking about just male-male couples,、yes. uh, where there is no egg source and there is no uterus,、uh, then indeed、uh, IVF is only the only real way to uh, uh, become pregnant in most scenarios.、Um, the the most common way is to identify an egg source. And to create embryos with this, one of the sperm sources. Sometimes both parents will be involved in creating the embryos, and sometimes it will just be one. Ultimately, once those embryos are created, we grow them and test them to make sure that they're healthy, and we can often tell gender at that point. And then what we do is we take on a surrogate to hold the pregnancy, and Place the embryo into that surrogate at a later time to affect pregnancy. So that, by far, is the most common way of helping two men conceive a pregnancy.、Mm -hmm. uh, there's something called traditional surrogacy, which is almost really never done anymore.、Uh, but in that scenario,、uh, IVF is not needed. What we do is we stimulate the ovaries of a surrogate or of a woman, and then just place sperm into the uterus of that woman.、Mm -hmm. So we call that、uh, traditional surrogacy. It、uh, again is almost never done anymore.、Um, probably goes beyond the topic of this discussion, but mostly legal.、Uh, legally, it's difficult、um, or can become difficult. To establish parental rights after the baby is born, so most of the time, it's done through IVF. Got it. Sounds like there's more steps.
So I wanted to know that、um, what percentage of your patients are same-sex couples looking forward to have a baby through the assisted reproduction? Uh, I'd say that、uh, about a third of my couples are of the LGBT community. So that includes、uh, two women,、uh, and certainly includes two men.、Uh, sometimes there are、um, uh, patients that are transitioning and want to freeze eggs or sperm prior to transitioning. So that's another、uh, facet. I'd say that about a third of my Uh, couples are of the LGBT community. Got it. So, for、uh, male same-sex couples who are considering to have this journey, what kind of like examinations or tests and、uh, preparations should be necessary for them to consider before starting the process?、Um, it's a good question.、Um, by far, the most important initial thing、uh, in the male-male situation is、mm-hmm. to do a sperm analysis. Uh, we check for four things、uh, on that sperm analysis. We look at the volume of the sperm,、mm-hmm. the concentration, the fraction of sperm they're swimming, and then the shape of the sperm.、Mm-hmm. If there is a problem, sometimes we do additional testing called the DNA fragmentation index to evaluate the integrity of the sperm. That usually is the result of maybe something like the morphology being abnormal that would cause us to look further.、Um, once we have、uh, that sperm analysis and、uh, hopefully it's normal, then what we will also do are some blood tests.、Uh, in the scenario of、uh, preparation with the surrogate, there's two main blood tests that will be needed. We will do a genetic screening to make sure that the intended father does not have a genetic predisposition.、Mm-hmm. What that means is that if we combine that sperm with an egg donor egg, that they will not have any matching diseases that may cause a problem to the baby.、Mm-hmm. We call those autosomal recessive diseases. The second thing that we do is we check blood work for infectious diseases. This is required by the FDA for us to collect this blood work and do screening at the time of the collection of the sperm or within seven days. What this does is it tests for diseases like hepatitis, HIV, etc., and it's a required component. To be obtained, so that we can utilize that sperm in a surrogate in the future.、Mm-hmm. Got it. So it's good to know that there are a lot of like process to help them, you know, thorough examinations to help them to ensure to have a healthy baby. So the key question that many people have: What is the way for male same-sex couples to have a baby? Is this possible for a child? To have a biological, you know, connection to both parents.、Uh, the answer is only if there's twins. <laughs> so、uh, there can only be one sperm source per embryo.、Mm-hmm. So、uh, let's say there's two men and they want to each have、uh, biologic input, meaning DNA input.、Mm-hmm. Uh, then the only way to effectively do that is to create embryos. With one man's sperm and create embryos with the other man's sperm,、mm-hmm. and the only way that both of them are going to be represented from a DNA perspective is indeed to、uh, have two different embryos that implant into either the same surrogate or two different surrogates. Got it. So, what about the choosing an egg donor? It is very crucial. A part of the process, and what factors should be considered when considering, you know, selecting a good egg donor. So that's a, also a very good question, Leah.、Um, I'll start off by saying,、uh, in an ideal world,、uh, there are things that we would like to look for in an egg donor.、Mm-hmm. So ideally, less than thirty years of age.、Uh, if she has done egg donation before, which is not always possible. We at least
would like to make sure that her ovarian reserve is good, that she has a good number of eggs. So we do a blood test called an AMH blood test. Uh, and we look for that number to be, um, again, greater than two or maybe three to give us an indication that the ovarian reserve is good. Mm -hmm. If she has never donated before. If she has donated before, then we have additional information and desires. So hopefully that egg donor has produced more than 20 eggs in a mm -hmm. prior cycle. Yeah. And ideally, prior cycles will have resulted in a pregnancy. So that's, you know, a lot of information for us to, or for the agency to provide the um, intended parents. But those are ideal things that we look for that may or may not always be present when searching for an egg donor. Mm -hmm. Now, that is the scenario in a fresh egg donor, meaning that she's, donating her eggs to uh, in an active cycle mm -hmm. to the intended parents. Um, if she is donating to two intended fathers mm -hmm. and they both want to have uh, a biologic child, then ideally, again, more than 20 eggs is what's desired because as we fertilize the eggs and create embryos and test them for normalcy, there's going to be attrition. Yeah. And so we want to make sure that the parents each end up starting off with a good number of eggs. Mm -hmm. That is all that we need to consider in a fresh egg donation cycle. It, there's also the potential for using frozen egg donor eggs. Mm -hmm. In that scenario, the benefit is that they are already there frozen and they can choose from those frozen eggs. Uh, it makes the process a little bit easier because legal contracts don't need to be entered. We will already have all the genetic and FDA screening available. Mm -hmm on those eggs so that we don't have to wait for that to be done. Mm -hmm. So the process is streamlined with frozen eggs, uh, but some people prefer to have all the eggs in a particular fresh egg donation cycle. Mm -hmm. And most of the consideration there is numerical. So in a frozen egg cycle, you may only get five or eight eggs, whereas in a fresh cycle, yeah, the sky is the limit, right? Um, mm -hmm. However many she produces are the couples. Got it. So it sounds like if they're going to use the fresh egg, they're going to have more uncertainty, you know, uh, in the process because you are not sure how many eggs, um, you know, can be produced. But if they're going to use the frozen eggs, it can kind of like being guaranteed because they have been, have been already being evaluated. Is that right? Uh, well, not entirely. So, uh, the fresh, sorry, the frozen egg donor cycle, usually they only get X number of eggs, whether that's six or eight eggs or whatever that number is. When you have a fresh cycle, the benefit is if the donor produces 30 eggs, for example, mm -hmm. they are all those couples. Yeah. The problem with the fresh egg donation is if it's the first cycle, there may be a learning curve and you may not know how many eggs you get yeah. until you stimulate the ovaries. Right. Got it. And uh, I know that in some states in the U.S., the LGBTQ couples may need to go through additional legal procedures to be recognized as legal parents of their children. So what about California? Does California have good laws to these couples? Uh, California laws are fortunately one of the most understanding uh, states for, for LGBTQ um, communities in that um, there is a streamlined process uh, for establishing parental rights mm -hmm. once the, the, the embryo uh, has been transferred and pregnancy has occurred. So fortunately, uh, this is a very... Uh, 
good state for uh, a couple to consider surrogacy in, uh, in that it is a very well thought out legal process that is uh, very um, uh, forgiving to couples that desire to have a, um, a child through surrogacy. Got it. So finally, are there any questions you have been asked a lot, but I didn't ask? You wanted to tell uh, to our audience any like misconceptions you wanted people to know. Um, yes, uh, the, you know the process can be difficult uh, because oftentimes, uh, you know, the the couple comes and they want to know how long this will take and be yeah. very, very uh, assertive about the, num the amount of time that it will take. And sometimes uh, patience is golden. You, you need to identify an egg donor that is best for their needs. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes that takes some time. Mm -hmm. uh, but once we've identified the donor, uh, then the process should be streamlined. Uh, and then we get together as a group, uh, the two parents and myself, or the single male and myself, to uh, discuss the embryos. Got it. The next component is then screening the surrogate, which can also take time. We have to make sure that her uterus is normal, that there's no drugs in her system, that she has no infections, and make sure that she's healthy. So that can take some time. And the added uh, complexity is that we have to have legal contracts in place. Um, but again, once that's done and the legal contracts are in place, the procedure is actually pretty easy on the surrogate. And soon after the transfer, usually within eight to 10 days, we are able to identify if pregnancy occurred. Mm -hmm. Then the real waiting game begins of watching the pregnancy develop uh, into a baby for ultimate delivery. So I think that one thing that's important for a couple to know is that um, it is a little bit of a process, uh, but certainly an incredible process uh, to ultimately receive the child of your dreams in your arm. Wow. And also, we talk about male same-sex couples, and then you also provide services to female same-sex couples, right? Sure, absolutely. We, um, we take care of the entire LGBT community. Um, and if it's two women, we have other options uh, simply because there's two egg sources yeah. and two uterine sources. Got it. Thank you so much. Uh, I feel like uh, there's very informative and the story is being encouraging. And if you're interested, we can put it in our two-way mark. If you're interested, you can put it in our two-way mark. If you're interested, you can put it in our two-way mark. Because we have a Chinese phone call. The Chinese phone call is Dr. Wilcox, the doctor, Linda. The phone call is 206-399-7700. Now, today, the guest to the show is Dr. David Turgeman. He's a very good doctor. 资深的这个在行业内面深耕三十年的这个专家哈，如果大家想找的话，也是拨打这个咨询电话二零六三九九七七零零。那今天那么讨论的是男同性啊 couple 想要一个宝宝的话，这个过程刚刚 Doctor Turchman 也讲到，就是说如果是女同性的这个家庭呢，是想要宝宝的话是不一样的这个流程哈，但是呢他也会负责处理，因为他有百分之三十的这个病人呢都是 LGBTQ plus 的这个家庭。那下一期呢，我们将会有更多来自 HR。生殖中心的权威专家为我们讲解代孕或者是捐精捐卵宝宝的更多注意事项。我们下期节目不见不散。Thank you so much, Dr. David Turchman, uh, for uh, joining our show. Uh, I'm looking forward to talk to you next episode. Thank you very much, Leah. Have、Thank、a good day, and we look forward to helping you all. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye.